Vroom, vroom. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think of this crank then, eh? Oh yeah. What do you think of this? What do you think of that then, eh? I could, uh, do you think I could get on with taking this to pieces? Well, a lot of people have asked me about the roller bearing crankshaft in a Type 35. So it just so happens that Timothy has got a complete Type 35 replica engine which actually belongs to him. So I could borrow some of the bits. It originates for France and it looks like a pretty good job. And, but obviously it'll all get taken to pieces and checked anyway. So so that is one of the reasons that I decided that this is a time to do the crank. But leading up to it, it's quite an interesting story. Our, the red car, which was that car, got banned by the Vintage Sports Car Club. What happened was, we had a premises in Greenford and we got involved with this chap called Ed Hubbard, who was quite a character. He'd owned wax oil, and he'd sold out wax oil for, obviously, a lot of millions. And uh, while he was with wax oil, he was a touch trade show, I believe, and he met Stanley Mann. And Stanley Mann sold him a load of Bentleys. So while he was going all over the world and doing the wax oil business, Stanley was flogging in Bentleys and they were getting put in the fruit farm for when Ed would eventually retire. So I can't remember how many there were, but it was certainly more Bentleys than anybody else in the world had got, I'm sure. And um, so anyway, so eventually he retires. And of course, then he starts to use the cars and obviously he needed quite a lot of work doing. So that's how I got involved. And he came to see me one day at my premises in uh, Greenford and he said, oh, I've got this little Type 35, which actual fact he paid a lot of money for and he bought it as a proper car. But it wasn't a proper car, it was a made-up car. It had a replica chassis. There was odd original bits in it, but it wasn't a complete car. So the more friendly I got with him, in the end, we were working together. So I said, that 35, Ed, it's no good of you going around telling everybody what a lovely original because everybody knows it ain't an original car. Why don't we just take it all to bits, you pay for the bits, I'll do the work, and we'll build a racing car out of it. And you can call it what you like then, but it'll make its own history. So old Ed thought that was a very good idea. So that is how the red car started, with a Type 35 that had been made up for bits, I think by Keith Butty, and you know it didn't have any history it was it was it was a difficult thing really but because they'd had enough money that if anybody had said that's a replica we could have sued them so usually the Bugatti owners club tends to keep quiet when that happens but anyway that was what happened so me and the boys Neil Davis John Berry Lorne Jacobs um Oh, God, and we had an engine man who was really good. He was a speedway man. Um, oh, his name will come to me in a minute. But anyway, that's the red car. So what happened was we did the red car and we put it all together. Now, you've got to remember, but prior to this, I'd done production saloon car racing for five years. So I'd done a lot of racing. I've been, I mean, one year we did 36 races. So you can imagine I was at every circuit in the country up to Ingleston, Brands Hatch, Mallory Park, Alton Park, Snetterton, Croft, oh, everywhere. <coughs> and I'd done very well. So anyway, so we built the red car, and we go testing with it, and the boys said, oh, we could do this, we could do that. I said, L -l let's do anything. Let's just get it together, go testing. That's more important than spending weeks filing little bits and trying to make it better than it should be. And that's exactly what we did. Anyway, we took it to Silverstone, it went like a rocket. But unfortunately, Bugatti 
When they made the original ceiling blocks, they had like a little window and the spark plug sat behind this little window and it pre-ignitioned. And if you really got a gum on methanol, it gave a problem. The plugs would melt. I finished up with two stroke plugs that were hard as hard. And even then I had to drive pretty gently and obviously if I wasn't winning, I'd keep it to the end and then drive like a loony for two laps and then it would probably melt its plugs. Anyway, the only modification we did to that car, we took the blocks off and we poured them right out and we put adapters in and we put 40 mil plugs in. But other than that, the car was an absolutely standard car. Standard crank, standard everything. But again, because of all my racing experience, I learned that if you're going to really rev something and drive it like a loony, it's got to be like brand new. So starting off with not much of a car was quite a good thing. So we had a, a really good front axle. Everything was as good as it could be. And one of the key parts was the roller bearing crank, which was brand spanking new from Brillerton Engineering, north of Watford. Um, and um, it was brilliant. I mean, Brillertons were a fabulous firm. Those cranks they made were absolutely fantastic. Now, obviously, old brigades have got a bit of a reputation for chucking rods out. They don't chuck rods out because the rods ain't very strong and there's something wrong. They chuck rods out because in the old days, the cranks weren't cleaned out, they were running on old oil, the things weren't worth a lot of money, people would rev them, the oil would stop going to the big end, the big end was seized and then it would break the rod and throw it out the side. So obviously, none of that was going to happen to me because everything was going to be absolutely perfect. And I can tell you now, I used to rev that car. Well, they all, obviously, one of the reasons got the reputation, they'd never seen a Bugatti go like it. I mean, I was really revving it. I mean, at times it went to 7,000 revs. But I knew it wouldn't go wrong because it was all brilliant and it never went wrong. So that's why, in the end, mind you, old Ed G'd him up a little bit. I mean, he was G'd the Vintage Sports Car Club. But, oh, I don't care what it costs and all that jazz, which they don't like very much. So it wasn't completely their fault. But anyway, in the end, they banned it because it was a replica. But the good thing is, a lot of people in the vintage sports car club said, how can you ban it? Because it hasn't got an original chassis. Half the cars racing ain't got original chassis. A lot of the ERAs ain't got original chassis because they've all been crashed and what have you. So that was when they had the meeting and they decided that a car's got five bits. Front axle, back axle, engine, gearbox, chassis and the cars had to have three of the major bits well my car that red car actually had three of the red bits but the other thing that happened look when we did it it said oh we'll have it red i always have my racing cars red and we'll have black wheels well not really the thing to do with a bugatti but i mean he was the governor and he paid for it so he had what he wanted but then, of course it did go very well and I could drive it, and people hadn't realised what I'd done driving because the people in this game don't know what happens in saloon car racing. But anyway, so the rumours were this was a lightweight car. The radiator was made of aluminium. That's why we painted it red. In fact, on this picture, there's a little bit just there where they made me rub the paint off to see that it was a proper brass or... German silver radiator. Some, another one of the rumours were the wheels were black because they were made of carbon fibre. What a load of nonsense. And of course, none of this did me any good because there was an old boy called Bob Roberts who got a V12 Tiger. It was a Sunbeam Tiger. It was a world record thing. It had been completely rebuilt in the 30s by Thompson and Taylor, so that wasn't an original car. But this old boy owned the Midland Motors Museum and he was much more in with the Vintage Sports Car Club than I was, especially with my accent. So anyway, somebody heard, I forget where we were, but somebody said, oh, I've just heard an, I overheard a conversation and they were saying about your car, there's obviously something not right with it and we'll have to get to the bottom of it. Well, they all came round and we took it to pieces and they all looked at it and there was nothing that they could find that was wrong because it was absolutely original. So, so that was the star bill. But one of the reasons that I could drive it, and I drove it like I did, 
I wasn't going to break any original bits. It had a new crankcase and a new crankshaft. So if it had chucked the rod out the side, it didn't have any numbers on it, so it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, obviously it had been expensive, but oh, it had plenty of money, so I wasn't worried about that. So I used to buzz it. And when I raced with um, Tim Llewellyn in the 8-litre Bentley with a 3-litre chassis, he is a very good driver. And very often it would get to the point where if I knew if I changed gear, he'd get in front of me, so I'd leave it in third and, and over-rev it. But anyway, so that was that. So anyway, so now we're talking about the crankshaft. Um, I think we've covered that pretty good. By the way, this pile of photographs, what happened was old Ed, he had millions of them done, and I think they were put in autosport or something like that. So if you go in a, in a shed and see one of them on the wall, it's because they took it out of autosport in 1988, I think it was, 88, because it was the start. Ed organised this Cars of the Century and raised money for the Prince's Trust. And um, Charlie came, flew in in the helicopter and drove one of our Bentleys round the, round the track. And, and obviously I met him and everything. I've got no pictures of me meeting Charlie. John Berry, who works with me, you know, he's got a fabulous picture of him sitting in a car with some girl who just asked if she could go in the car and talking to Prince Charles. I ain't got a single picture, but I think Ed had a lot to do with that. But anyway, so that's that. So now let's talk about the crankshaft. As you can see, it's a magnificent bit of engineering. I mean, this is really clever. I'm very proud to say that Timothy's actually made a few of these because the one and a half litre cranks have not been available and he made a one and a half litre crank where the cotter pins, instead of being there, they're there and it's got a shorter stroke. But anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so this is a brand new Brillaton crank and I think they've retired now, the boys at Brillaton and... Michael Hope was a really good bloke and he, um, he told me how to take the bits and put them together because I always asked everybody. I took advice from anybody. And, um, and this was the key to my Bugatti being so good because I didn't used to worry, I just used to buzz it. And, and, and that was it. But anyway, the silly part is people think this is the cleverest thing in the world because how do you take it to bits and clean it? You know, it must all be pressed together and... Oh, well, it isn't. It's not pressed together at all. It's got cotter pins like a bicycle. And I'll take this front section off and you'll see. So you've got a split pin, which I previously, you know, straightened out so you can get it out. But anyway, so you take the strip pin out. Obviously, it's a bit more difficult than that. And you undo the nut. Now... Everything on this crank is numbered. On the end of there is a number, and on there there's a number, there there's a number. So when you take, you can take this to bits, lay it all out on the thing, clean it all, and put it back together again, and it will run as true as true. Now, obviously, the original cranks have got butchered over the years, so very often we have to do a bit of straightening them out. What we do, we, we make new cotter pins, and we've got a thing that put it on the surface to, grinder to grind the faces and everything and obviously we made up some some of these blocks which they put the crank in and turn it and get it square so there is a bit of fiddling and there also is an, a good way of reconditioning original cranks and when I get this to bits I'll show you but anyways so now we got the cotter pin this is a tool we've made up I should think this has been with us for th 30 years and then you have to give it a right old whack. I'll get a proper hammer. The cotter pin literally will fall out. And there it is. Now, obviously, that angle is very important. So you can't put it in wrong. It's got to go back exactly as it cut the pieces. And as I say, we've got a special tool. We put those in and we grind them. 
and then you have to clock it up and that's the right drama I couldn't do it I couldn't have the patience but anyway so there you are that's got a number on there and a number on there so you ain't going to get that wrong now this is the bit that sh shocks people because they think oh it's all got to be pressed together and everything look look at that I mean obviously it's brilliant grinding I mean Brillantons were a bloody good firm I mean look at that there's no slack in that but it ain't tight it just comes apart and then obviously you've got the con rod and the bearings so that comes off of there and then all the balls fall out Brillantin engineering again that's all brilliant. Now the reason that's copper plated is because I think it made a VN36. So they're case hardened. And if you copper plate them, the case hardening doesn't affect the rest of the metal. So the only bit you want case hardened is that bit in there and that bit in there. So that's why they look like they're made of copper, but they're not, they're copper plated. So that's that. That's a lovely lightweight um cage because obviously when you rev the car up that all spins and these rollers skid and that again is when you start a Bugatti up A the cylinder blocks ain't got enough cooling on a 35 so you've got to let it tick over because you want the heat to get into the block you don't want freezing cold petrol coming in one side and red hot gases going out the other side with no cooling between the valve seats they just crack so you've got to warm it up but also because it does this good because obviously the oil being cold if you go boom that'll just skid so you, so you're skidding on there so the slower you can run it constant speed you don't want to be all that revving up and letting it down you want to have boom 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 let it tick over timothy's on his type 51 he's got a really good method now he bolts a little tiny carburetor which i bought a beauty hundred years ago and he starts it up on petrol, so you haven't got all that methanol washing the the valve, uh, the piston rings and what have you. And also, because it gives all this a chance to warm up. So that is very important. So anyway, so it's a dead simple thing. You put that on there. You put all those back in with a bit of grease or something. Although I think you can literally do it with a bit of oil if you stand it up so that it doesn't uh, wobble about. And you assemble it. And then you slide that back in there, giving it a little bit of a warm doesn't do any harm because getting it to start is not easy. So every little bit you can get a bit of an advantage by warming it up, it'll expand it a little bit and it does help. Obviously, when you're going to put it in properly, you're going to assemble all this, which I'll do later because there's no point in worrying about that at this stage. Right, we'll give it a try. And that's how it goes together. And then you put this in like that. And this is what Michael Hope showed me at British Engineering who made the cranks. He said, What you do, you tap that in. until the hammer bounces back at you. So you can feel that's going in. That's going in, now you watch. 
power and bouncing back. So that's it. So then you put the nut on. Now, when I took this to bits, I marked the nut. And it's the marks there and the marks there. And I think you'll find that you pull that round. Now, it looks like from there to there is how much you tighten it. Now I'm not I'm not gonna tighten it because obviously I want to put all that back together. But it's not ridiculously tight and that is where people go wrong. They don't do the banging on there so you know that the tape has settled in nice and they they put it in and then they tighten this up to try and pull the cotton pin into position. Well You've got no control over it, so you're pulling that. You don't know whether it's gone in nicely or whatever. But doing it with the thing and it bouncing back to you, you know that everything is lovely and solid. And all you've got to do is tighten that nut up. And you don't tighten it up a lot. The marks there, I would say, about a quarter of a turn. But there ain't no... There ain't no torque setting that I know of. Obviously, you've got to line up the the um, slip pin hole. Anyway, so that's it. I've lined the slip pin hole up, and obviously, you've got to assemble all that. So I'll take it to bits again. falls out and you can see where it rests on it look there's just a very faint mark it's quite obvious that Brillis has ground these up and sort of varied them because that's a number eight I've never noticed that before so this is probably a later crack than I've ever seen and as you can see, that's not tight, but it's lining it up. That initial getting that first bit in is it's not easy. See, that's run out of line now, and it's gone tight. So really, what you've got to do, you've got to go and pull it straight out. Now, on original cranks, this is the bit, obviously, that wears out. So what they do... This is Tim reconditioning an A worn crank. They grind that off and they make a sleeve that goes on there with an oil weight all the way round. So when the oil comes through that little hole there, it can go all the way round inside the sleeve. And then they grind a lump out of there and they put a sleeve in there. And then they get a needle roller bearing, which is about, well, oh, 
you know, nowhere near that size. So with a needle roller bearing, which comes from Japan, it's a lovely thing with a lovely cage and everything. So you've relined that and you've relined that, put it together and you put this needle roller in and it works like a charm. And when it wears out, obviously you can take it a bit, put a new one in there, a new one in there, a new needle roller and it's back in business. So it's quite a good idea, really. I mean, but Brillerton's never deviated from original. They did everything as it was original, which I think is very good. And uh, and as I say, I never had any trouble, and I used to buzz one of these like you can't believe. And that's it. But now, one of the things with this crank is that it gets oiled in that groove. So you've got these things in the crankcase, and as you can see, they've got silly little holes in them, so it don't take a lot to block them up. And this is what I'm saying, that's what used to happen in the old days, and that's how they used to throw a rod out of sight. So that goes in the crankcase, which I'll show you in a minute, about there. And the oil squirts out of there and goes into that angular groove there, so that acts like a centrifugal oil filter. So all the dirt goes to the outside, and they didn't have paper filters in them days, so they had a, a gauze filter, which, you know, took the sparrows and big rocks out, but it didn't take the micro bits out. So, so then it goes in that little tiny hole there, and it comes out there. Now, with non-detergent oil, I mean, I remember my dad years ago when I was a kid. I took this rocket box off of a, a car. I mean, I was really young. I wasn't. I was probably 12 or something and it had been on detergent oil my dad went oh it's like brand new inside he was used to that being a black load of sludge and that is the oil that they used to run in these now obviously this is not brilliant design I mean a plain bearing crank they don't have roller bearing cranks anymore but this would run on nothing we all know a two stroke you put a little bit of oil in the bloody petrol and it would go forever and Obviously, when they were racing these, they were doing 300-mile races and things. Well, you could have put cooking oil in there and it probably wouldn't have seized up. So they didn't have the oil and they didn't have the filtration. So when you, they got a reputation that every 3,000 miles, you had to take these to bits and scoop the dirt out of there. And I have taken old engines to bits. And I have scooped the dirt out of there because it obviously just acts like a centrifugal filter and that eventually blocks up solid, stops the oil going to the rod. Next thing you know, it's got a rod out of sight because that lot gets red hot in about a second. <coughs> got these little oil jets like that and they've got silly little holes in them so we always make new ones of them because there's always a little bit hiding down there that when you're doing 7,000 revs, comes out, cocks that hole up and puts the rod out of sight. So we never use old ones in there. If you take original engine to bits, you think you can clean them out, and you probably can. But we don't chance it. We always make new ones. And they, they go in there like that, and they squirt onto that ring that's in there. And then this one gets oil pressure sent to the centre main and what spills out of there gets caught in the rings there to all those two rods. So those rods get oiled with them. That one gets oiled with the waste oil coming out of there. That one there again has one of them and that's it. And then all of this lot is oiled with an oil gallery that runs along there. And you can vary the size of the jets in them because they don't just leave them wide open. And there's another theory as well that a roller bearing crank, if you put too much oil in it, it tends to make a bow wave in front of the balls or the rollers and they skid. So you can go over the top with throwing oil in there like a loony, which I never did. I just used to read Mr Conway's book and I think it gives you the size of the holes, I can't remember now, but we stuck to original. And I tell you, you can't break one of these. I've read one of these like ridiculous and um, that stands up to it. And the only reason that is such a fabulous success is because it didn't leave very good oil in the day, provided you service it regularly. Well, now we've got a paper filter that goes in the original filter 
and I've had customers that have done 30 or 1,000 miles of their engines and not taken them to bits because with detergent oil, and you can argue about oil as well with these, I don't know what to say about that, and, um, and filtration, they're, 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 you know, they're perfect. Now, the free bearing engine, which is a plain bearing engine, doesn't have them, but it still has that in the crankcase. So what you can do, if you want to make a three bearing engine into a five bearing engine, you have to get some of them caps, which I think are made by the club or for instance, I know we've got a pattern for them, and you fit them, line bore it, and you can put one of those cranks in, you know, you have to do all this bit, a lot of work, but you can turn a three bearing engine into a five bearing engine, which works like a charm. So that's that, that's that. Obviously I've got to assemble that. Um, that's the lovely little flywheel. The clutch goes in there and it's cast iron on steel and it works like a charm. I used to put duck oil in. My racing car always had an original clutch. But these days people don't seem to be able to cope with that. So we, we instead of putting iron and steel, we put steel and we have a sintered clutch which um, works like a charm, don't have to fill out with oil every five minutes, don't need servicing. My little 35, I drove it to Strasbourg, left here, drove to Strasbourg, and by the time I got to Strasbourg, with a completely original clutch, you needed to take the little thing out and squirt some oil in it, to obviously replenish what had come out. Mary used to, get, when we drove down to Strasbourg, Mary had a black, waste bag on her feet, on her legs. So get in the car and put it on because the oil coming out of the clutch would get soaked. That's why you always see oil on the floor in the Bugatti because it's got an original clutch. And obviously with the sintered lining, it don't do that. So that's another good thing from the person who don't know what they're doing. But another th funny thing in this, which is quite a funny thing, this is a blower drive. Now this is a blower drive. It isn't made for that engine because normally they have a bit which locates the crank. But if you look at this Tanya real close up, this is an original drive. So what happens is on the end of that crank, it's got a thing that goes in there with spring steel bits, which allows it to move. So it acts like a damper. And if you look at that, it's got a nice radius in there. Now we had this engine that was dead rough and it never felt right. And um, we, we hadn't done it, but anyway, we took it to bits and it was like that. Now that's obviously a replica bit that someone's made and they've just made that dead square. So when the crank oscillates, which they all do, it can't move. So instead of acting as a damper, it just joins the blower. So obviously then that's trying to do that. So having those sprung steel clips in there and a nice radius on there means it works. But what an easy mistake. You know, some tool maker goes straight through there with a mill, they give it to the engine man, he's never seen one of them. Luckily, I've seen one of them. That was one of the things I did with the Bugattis. I used to look at everything like a loony, you know, because I was obviously interested in originality. I mean, I looked at the springs and I looked at the shock absorbers. I looked at everything. And very often I'd sit next to Mr. Conway Senior at a, um, a do of something with a Bugatti. Because once I started racing and winning things, I became acceptable, even with his terrible old accent. So I used to sit next to Mr. Conway because he knew I knew what I was talking about and he loved mechanical things. And I'd say to him, what about this? And then we'd go, oh, I'm not, I don't think that's right, my boy. I said, well, I think it is. And a week later, he'd have a look at it and he'd come back to me and he'd say, you're absolutely right. You know, he was a very good man, Mr. Conway. He knew what, what was what, you know. I mean, he worked at Rolls Royce. He was a, I think he was the highest qualified engineer in Great Britain. And I loved him. I thought he was a good man. You could easily fall out with him, but he was a proper person. I mean, if you found something and you argued with him and, and it turned out you were right, he would come back and say, you're absolutely right. I never looked at it like that closely before. I had a great controversy with rear springs on a Bugatti, which are very important. 
And, uh, and he said, no, I don't think that's right. I said, well, I think you'll find it is. Anyway, when he, he did his research, he found out I was right. And, um, you know, it's the same. He just come to me and said, well, you're absolutely right, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I could write a book about being with old Ed and all this nonsense, you know, and he was involved with the £10 million Bentley, you know, when they all finished up in the High Court. That was Ed. By then, I'd left. I'd had enough of it by then, and I said to him, well, Ed, I can't stand this anymore, so off I went. And that's when I started on my own again, and that's when I bought the farm. So, um, so that's it, really. I mean, I don't know whether I should have assembled that on camera, I think I will, but I'm obviously going to wash my hands and clean it up. Well, that's all going to come to bits again, because Tim won't trust that. That'll all be looked at very carefully. So I could put that together quite rough, really. So that's probably what I'll do. Jack Lemon Burton's oil can. If old Jack's looking down, he'd be very pleased to see us using that. Put a little bit of oil to hold them in. That's, obviously, I've done the others. Put that one in. Right. Number facing that way, because that's how they were numbered. And you put that on there, and then you've got to fiddle that on. There you go. And that's it. And as long as there's oil getting on that, I'm telling you, they don't go wrong. So now, I'm going to attempt to feed that lot onto there. But obviously, you've got to hold all this together so that the bearings don't fall out. But, and we've got soft jaws, I hope you notice that. Right, here we go. And that's it. So you could take all that to pieces and providing you're careful and you put it back together carefully and take note of all the numbers, which are just there. That goes in there. Do the thing that Brunerton showed me, Michael Hope. See, and then, and then the hammer springs back. That's settled. Put a nut on. I wouldn't be surprised if old Tim's got a talk setting there to sort it out, but we never had a talk setting when I did it. So I'm not going to tighten that up and pin it, because obviously it's all going to come to bits again. And the fact that I haven't tightened it up will mean that they will notice it. And whatever happens, that's going to come apart. I notice there's one when I'm done there. So, so that, um, yeah, obviously that's not in. That's in now, though. I didn't do that. But um, they probably had to take that off because they probably used the gear that goes in there on another engine. Um, and the problem with that is that when you put this lot together, you have to you have to put a look. There's a big thing goes on the end, and you push it together because obviously when it gets hot, the aluminium expands and the cranks wobbling about. So I used to put eight thou nip on them, which sounds a lot, but I don't think it was a lot because it always worked. So this thing you put in there, there's a big spacer, and you put eight thou on it. But then the next thing is you've got to set this gear because it's got um, a gear on it to drive the cam sh drive the overhead cam. And very often you can't get that in the right place, so you have to grind a little bit off the gear to go in there, or you have to build the, the gear up and grind it to get it in the right place for the bevel. So that's a bit of a drama, that is. And that's probably where that was probably a brand new one in there. And they've been building an engine and they've just robbed it out of this engine because it's Tim's engine. So it's like spares, really. But obviously it'll all get put together. 
But what a lovely bit of kit, eh? Now this, at the end, I believe, was over 20,000 quid, which is a lot of money to pay for a crankshaft. I remember the crankshaft I put in one of my cars, I didn't have the money to pay for it. And uh, luckily, I had a young bloke that I met years before, and, and, he, and he set up in business, and I really encouraged him. Um, you know, he said, oh, my dad said, if this, that, and the other, and if I do this, I'll inherit whatever. And I said to him, you'll be able to buy and sell your dad, because I could tell he was a sharp bloke. Anyway, he went in the motor business, earned a lot of money, and I rang him up one day, and I said, Jeff, can you lend me 10 grand? And he said, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> I borrowed 10 grand to buy the first crank. I obviously paid him back. But, um, and that was when they were 10 grand, which was a fortune, and they finished up 20 grand, I believe. But I can understand it. I mean, it's a bloody clever thing. Now, there's going to be a load of questions. People, you know, listen, I ain't that clever. I can't cover every little bit because there's no script here. We don't do any, like, put it together and then do it again. We just do it. So I'm bound to have forgot things that you might be interested. So if you ask the questions, I'm sure we can answer them. But I'm hoping that this is going to turn out to sort everybody out who asks me about roller bearing crankshafts. That's it. Don't forget to subscribe.